Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss porphyrin biosynthesis or heme biosynthesis. Heme is the principal porphyrin, and it's shown down here as protoheme, which is another term for heme. As most of you probably know, it's an iron-containing coenzyme that's going to be important in many enzymes in biology and also some proteins such as myoglobin and hemoglobin. We also know that uh, heme is going to be found in cytochrome P450 enzymes and then also some enzymes of the electron transport chain and many, many more. Let's talk about how we actually get heme or protoheme. The starting material for heme is delta amino levolinic acid, which is sometimes abbreviated as ALA, and that's how I'll be referring to it for the rest of the video. Now, we're going to need for one molecule of heme, we're actually going to need eight molecules of ALA, as shown right here. So we're going to need eight of these, but there's actually two separate schemes up here that can be used to generate ALA. This one on the left here, given as A, this is the reaction that's done in higher order eukaryotes, which includes mammals. And in this reaction, we have an enzyme called ALA synthase, or delta amino levolinic acid synthase. What this enzyme does is it condenses succinyl-CoA from the TCA cycle with the amino acid glycine. And with the loss of carbon dioxide, we end up in a one-step reaction, we get ALA. In some bacteria and very low order organisms, they use a separate pathway which involves glutamyl tRNA. So this is a tRNA that actually has bound glutamate. And in the first enzyme of this scheme, we have glutamyl tRNA reductase, which shoots a hydride right here at this carbonyl carbon, knocks off the tRNA, and that gives us glutamate 1 semialdehyde, which will then be transaminated twice by glutamate semialdehyde aminotransferase. Notice that the amine right here turns into a carbonyl. This carbonyl, which is the aldehyde, turns into amine. So it actually requires two reactions of the transaminase, and we get ALA. But regardless of uh, the source of ALA, the pathway is pretty well conserved. Okay? And this pathway has been studied both in bacteria and eukaryotic cells which possess mitochondria. And in fact, if we're talking about eukaryotic cells that are synthesizing heme, um, this is going to be a general uh, picture we're going to look at, uh, at at portions of this video because it turns out that heme synthesis actually spans two cellular compartments. Some of the reactions actually take place in the mitochondria here in this sort of lavender color, and the rest take place in the cytoplasm. And so let's now look at how we convert ALA, or eight molecules of it, into heme. The first enzyme is called ALA dehydratase. In some texts, this may be called porphobilinogen synthase because the product of this enzyme is porphobilinogen. Now, what you'll notice is that if you actually uh, count the carbons here, it basically doubles from ALA to porphobilinogen. And that's because to make one molecule of porphobilinogen, it actually requires two molecules of ALA. And so what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to condense two ALA molecules and form this what we call a pyrrole ring. This is what's called a pyrrole ring. It's an aromatic ring. And notice it has this carbon amine sticking off of it and a two-carbon carboxyl arm and a three-carbon carboxyl arm. Okay, that gives us porphyrin, also abbreviated PBG. Now, I've also got some other tricks over here to help you learn the synthesis of heme B, which is the principal heme shown down here. This enzyme, porphyrin deaminase, this enzyme is going to condense actually four molecules of porphyrin in the manner shown over here, which gives us hydroxymethyl bilane. Um, in this case, we're actually going to lose four ammonias. These actually come from this amine right here on this arm coming off of porphobilinogen, and it's going to condense those four porphobilinogens into hydroxymethylbilane. Now, there's a couple things I want to mention about the molecule hydroxymethylbilane. First of all, it has another name that you might see. It's also called pre uroporphyrinogen 3 Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, notice that we have, as I mentioned, these four pyrrole rings. Uh, because of that, hemes and porphyrins, all of these, are actually sometimes referred to as tetrapyrroles because there's four of these pyrrole rings. And as you go around clockwise, starting at this one right here where my mouse is, they have a letter designation. This is the A ring, and going around clockwise, B ring, C ring, and D ring. 
And the third thing I want you to notice is that each of these, other than this A ring, which has this hydroxymethyl group sticking out, each pyrrole ring has a two carbon arm followed by a three carbon arm. And as you go around clockwise, two carbon arm, three carbon arm, two carbon arm, three carbon arm, two carbon arm, three carbon arm. Okay, that's gonna play a role in just a minute. Uh, but notice that each of those ends in a carboxyl group. We then have the enzyme uh, uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase. So this enzyme is going to convert hydroxymethylbilane into, as we would expect, uroporphyrinogen 3. Now, there's a couple things to notice about what this reaction is actually doing. These two carbon atoms, one, this uh, carbon atom of the hydroxymethyl group on the A ring, and this carbon of the D ring are going to get condensed. Notice that we actually have closure of the, of complete closure of the pyrrole ring, and we could say complete closure of this macro cycle. Also, the OH goes away. But the other thing that you should notice is that if you actually look at, around the ring, we have the two carbon arm, three carbon, two carbon, three carbon, two carbon, three carbon, and then three carbon, two carbon. It actually flips here. Now we have the enzyme uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. What this enzyme is going to do is you basically look at uroporphyrinogen 3, find all of the carboxyls on the two carbon arms. There's four of them. Here's one, here's a second, a third, and a fourth, and it's going to remove all those carboxyl groups as carbon dioxide and leave nothing but methyl groups left. So notice all of those carboxyl groups on the two carbon arms are gone and we just have simple methyl groups remaining. And that's going to be the reaction of uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, which gives us coproporphyrinogen 3. Now, this enzyme, coproporphyrinogen oxidase, is going to do something fairly similar, except what it's going to do is it's going to target uh, both remaining carboxyl groups on the A and B rings. Okay, so these rings up at the top, A and B ring, these two carboxyl groups are again going to be lost as carbon dioxide, but all we're going to have in as remains are what we call vinyl groups. And these little uh, double bond, these alkenes sticking off of the ring like this, this, these are what we call vinyl groups. And it only does that on the A and B rings. And that's going to give us this molecule down here on the bottom left, protoporphyrinogen 9. Now, the next enzyme, protoporphyrinogen oxidase, is going to convert protoporphyrinogen 9 into protoporphyrin 9. And the only difference between these two molecules right here is that in protoporphyrinogen 9, all the pyrrole rings, all four of them, are actually, in terms of their conjugation, they're discontinuous. So the A ring is not conjugated to the pi electrons of the B ring. Likewise, the pi electrons of the B ring are not conjugated to the pi electrons of the C ring. All of these uh, pyrrole rings, at least from each other, are, dis are they're, they're di it's discontinuity. Okay? And if you look between each of these, there's just a CH2 group, and that's actually why there's a discontinuity. What protoporphyrinogen oxidase does is it actually adds in a net three double bonds, and that ultimately allows complete pi bond conjugation. So if you have to draw protoporphyrin 9, all you need to make sure to do is to conjugate every single double bond in the entire molecule. Conjugate every single double bond in this molecule. And if you look, each of these rings now, they're not technically pyrrole rings anymore, a little bit different, but all the double bonds are conjugated. And so, and so we now essentially have aromatic rings within a larger aromatic structure. All right, and the final enzyme in this scheme is ferrochelatase. This one's pretty simple. It just puts an iron right here in the center of the nitrogens, and then the nitrogens are going to chelate that iron. And that iron is where most of the chemistry is going to occur. For example, activation of molecular oxygen. All right, now, now that we've gone through uh, this entire pathway, let's actually look at the localization um, of each of these enzymes and show how heme synthesis spans two cellular compartments, and then we'll talk briefly about the regulation of the pathway. So first of all, notice that the reaction of ALA synthase, or delta amino levolytic acid synthase, is actually in the mitochondria. If you think about it, it makes sense. Succinyl-CoA is part of the TCA cycle. So that's already going to be in the mitochondrial matrix. Glycine can easily be in the mitochondria. So this is going to be a mitochondrial enzyme. It's going to generate ALA, delta amino levolytic acid, which is then going to be shuttled out into the cytoplasm. Now all of these enzymes are going to occur in the cytoplasm. So we have ALA dehydratase, or that is porphyrin synthase. 
This enzyme is usually called porphyrinogen deaminase, uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase, uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, and that's going to give us coproporphyrinogen 3. This molecule is going to be shuttled back into the mitochondria where it's going to react with the mitochondrial enzyme coproporphyrinogen oxidase. That's going to give you protoporphyrinogen 9, and then from there, again, all of these enzymes. Uh, for example, this one, uh, protoporphyrinogen oxidase and ferrochelatase are going to be mitochondrial enzymes. And so the heme is actually going to be generated in the mitochondria. Now, there are enzymes out in the cytoplasm, or really we could say at the smoothie are mainly, that are going to be heme-containing enzymes. So the heme will actually have to be transported out of the mitochondria and, into, uh, and be packaged into those enzymes to make the hollow enzymes. But it makes sense to have heme, uh, at least the final product here, inside the mitochondria because there's a lot of mitochondrial enzymes, particularly those of the electron transport chain that are going to be dependent on heme. But again, it's not to say there's not important ones in the cytoplasm, such as the smoothie are, like cytochrome P450 enzymes, which are heavily uh, concentrated on the smoothie are membrane. Those are going to be cytochrome P450 enzymes. So hopefully this makes sense as to the, the cellular localization of the pathway. It's roughly 50% split between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. Now let's think a little bit about the regulation of this pathway. The major regulatory point is the allosteric enzyme ALA synthase. Now, from what's shown here, there's only one allosteric regulator, and it's a negative allosteric regulator. That is heme. It turns out that heme can actually bind to a site on ALA synthase and shut off the activity, or at least turn off the activity of ALA synthase. That's direct allosteric regulation, and that's also another reason it makes sense to have heme inside the mitochondria, because that's where ALA synthase is. It makes sense to have the regulatory uh, allosteric molecule in the same compartment. So when heme starts to build up, and there's high amounts of heme, that tells the mitochondria, or the cell in general, we don't need any more heme synthesis. So heme will come over here and turn off ALA synthase allosterically, which is the committed step in the whole pathway. So if you have plenty of heme, then turn off the enzyme that initiates the production of heme, ALA synthase. Um, if heme levels start to drop, then that releases this uh, negative allosteric regulation on ALA synthase, and ALA synthase will become more active, and you'll end up going through this entire pathway to produce more heme. So heme's negative regulation on ALA synthase is a form of actually feedback inhibition, but it's actually just allosteric regulation. Now, these other control points, these are not allosteric forms of regulation. These are other types of regulation. I, I will say that glucose is a negative regulator of ALA synthase, but that has to do more with biosignaling events and changes in gene transcription and translation, gene expression in general. Um, it's not allosteric, but high amounts of glucose will actually negatively regulate the production of the enzyme ALA synthase at a transcriptional level. Other molecules such as alcohol and barbiturates, these are actually uh, viewed as toxins from the body's perspective. Um, it turns out that in some cases, and to very small amounts, alcohol as an ethanol can be metabolized by a P450 enzyme. I have a video actually on that process. It's actually called the microsomal system for ethanol oxidation. And because it's dependent on P450s, it would make sense that alcohol would induce the transcription and eventual translation of ALA synthase. Also, barbiturates are another uh, kind of drug-like molecule that the liver, in particular, perceives as a toxin. And so barbiturates will also uh, induce the formation of ALA synthase, so you can get more heme, because it turns out that barbiturates are also dependent on P450s, which are in turn dependent on heme. So basically, what I'm saying is in order to get rid of alcohol and barbiturates, but mostly the barbiturates, it requires heme because you have to have action of P450 enzymes, which are detoxification enzymes. And so that's why barbiturates and alcohol will induce ALA synthase because this is the committed step that leads to the production of heme, which will indirectly get rid of these two types of molecules. And in general, um, these are going to affect it through gene transcription, not by an allosteric mechanism. Hypoxia will also induce 
uh, the production of heme because heme is a cofactor for hemoglobin in particular in the blood. And so if you have low levels of oxygen, as in hypoxia, you need to have more of a capacity to bind the oxygen to hold on to what little you have. And so hypoxia will induce the, the transcription and eventual translation of ALA synthase, which leads to more heme production. And that heme will eventually be packaged into hemoglobin and also myoglobin for skeletal muscle, and that will help uh, hold on to what oxygen you do have. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a little bit of sense of the logic of porphyrin biosynthesis. We saw the production of heme. We saw the, the cellular localization of the different enzymes in the pathway, and we talked briefly about its regulation. But that's gonna give us specifically heme B. There are several other types of heme molecules, such as heme C and heme A, that we also need to be able to make, and we're gonna discuss the synthesis of those two classes of hemes in the next video. So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.